time. Uh, uh, let me divide it up into five or six points. The first is the question of genocide. We have to use our term very carefully, and we have to examine whether the term genocide is appropriate or not. Because, you know, I think we are here, and we are meeting in Harvard, partly because the epistemic, the knowledge content, is important here, but it's also because this knowledge is really important for political action, making the world a better place. And therefore, effectiveness is really important. To overplay one's hand would be a huge mistake. And as Zani pointed out, that when people talk about genocide, they think of somewhat, somewhat different, namely, like in what happened in Rwanda, suddenly Tutsis being killed, what happened in Khmer Rouge, uh, Cambodia, and so on. What we have to recognize is that there are two quite distinct things here. One is that genocide is really about killing people. And secondly, there are many other nasty things that are happening which are not part of genocide, but which goes with genocide. So we have to make a distinction. Now, I think the term slow genocide, snow burning genocide, I would even use the word slow genocide, is an appropriate fit here because you deny people healthcare, you deny people nutritional opportunities, you deny people the opportunity to work and earn an income, make a living and to feed themselves and their family members. You deny people having medical care, expel the only organization delivering health care, like the Medicis of Pontier, don't allow them to return. That is killing people. And in that sense, it is a genocide. It's a slow genocide. It's not like Rwanda, it's not like Khmer Rouge. Uh, it's not even like what exactly happened in Holocaust. Then there was some element of slowness there too, and there are many other analogies that apply. There's also, we have to bring in, uh, when we talk about genocide, think about gypsies in Germany, which people often forget. There are six million Jews who died, there were three million gypsies who died too. And so I think it's very important to bring in the, the institutionalized killing as seen as genocide and explain, since we have to communicate, you have to communicate, to the public in Burma, to which I've come, but first to the public in the world, that we do mean genocide and for a reason. It is killing that we are concerned with. It's killing that's taking place slowly and indeed it's already taken a huge number of lives and it will take many more unless we reverse this. So I think slow genocide, I'll come back to it when at the end I, I'm trying to summarize the thing, is one issue. But it's also important to recognize that it, genocide is not the only way that Rohingyas suffer from their unequal uh, treatment. Uh, they don't have the political rights, they don't have many of the economic rights as a standard. I already mentioned about medical rights, which will not only kill people, but also make people suffer, suffer pain, suffer degradation, suffer from leading a life which no human being should be living. So I think we are complaining about slow genocide, but more also, it's the targeting of Rohingya and all the denials that go with it, of which the denial of the opportunity to live is, is one, but there are others and we have to bear those in mind too. Now, the, an important thing to recognize here, which actually came up in the discussion of Zane, but also from the, from the Rohingya voices, is that there have been an attempt to, those, even those who are sympathetic to Rohingyas, to portray this as a kind of extremist, uh, anti, uh, extremist Buddhist going against uh, a Muslim community and to see this in the, as, a, as a kind of religious riot. Now I grew up 
part of my time, of course, I was in Burma, but then I was back in Dhaka and, and in Calcutta. And I remember how riots are constructed. Uh, when the decision is taken, and the colonial government played a major part in this, because divide and rule was a very big part of the government of India, it is easy to generate a situation when anger is cultivated, especially if you have people participating in that exercise of um, making one community inflamed against another. Now, there's every evidence on the basis of what I've uh, read and what I've heard even today, but also elsewhere, that this anger against the Rohingyas were carefully cultivated by the government itself. And given that, what we're looking at are two things. First of all, not a kind of simultaneous, suddenly an eruption of religious sentiment and, uh, uh, and not something which could be seen in, in, in terms even of religious conflicts going around across the world. It's a, it's a situation where one group had been in, made to by misinformation, uh, misdirection of what to look for, what to read, and misunderstanding that has been carefully fostered and generated, made very angry about these nasty people moving into Burma. As Dani pointed out, if you look at the history, even back even to the 17th century, he pointed out in the 19th century, uh, often the Rohingyas were not separated as a group. But that's standard, you wouldn't, uh, you know, if you are in India, you don't have, you don't specifically mention Santal, for example. You might say tribal, or you might say some other category. There are all kinds of categories. Uh, and the fact that they didn't mention that doesn't, doesn't mean anything at all. But after independence, Burmese government document themselves, including you quoted in the encyclopedia, recognize that. So there's no question that it isn't so much that Rohingyas moved into Burma, but Burma moved into Rohingyas in the sense that when India was divided, undivided India plus Burma governed from Delhi was undivided, you have to bear in mind, it was treated in the same territory. The Mughal emperor, the last of them, was actually sent to Burma, where he died. And it was, he was not only the last Mughal Empire, when the Indians had the rebellion, the one thing that they did agree on is that if the mutiny of 1857 is the success, um, it will be the Mughal king who would be the titular ruler of the entire country. He was sent to Burma, is treated as a, as the same, as a kind of same region. And, and that they reason, for, you know, this partition was always arbitrary. So it happened that Arakan and the Rohingya population waited, fell in Burma. Given that fact, there's no question of Rohingyas moving into Burma. They would have had to move out to get out of Burma because that's where they were born. Now, these are such obvious facts, it's amazing that people don't know it. Now, I have one question that comes up in my mind often, um, especially as someone who has been very moved, as I have in my childhood, from childhood days, by the ideas of Gautam Buddha, that what are Buddhists, given his message of peace, tolerance, is doing in this context? But the fact is that almost any group of people could be incited into violence. In case of Buddhists, this has happened often. You can't escape that fact. So I think there's no natural immunity in thoughts from 6th century BC that would give you a perpetual immunity to it because we live in the present and we can generate thought. I mean, this has gone on, the violation of what was said into different interpretation now, making it into a much bloodier situation has gone on in a very big way in, in, in redefining Islam as a, as a narrow, belligerent group.
as opposed to what it was. I mean, it, I was mentioning the fact that when the, when the mutiny took place in a country which was then, as it is now, primarily Hindu, the fact that they could agree on that the head would be a Mughal Muslim emperor indicated that it is Muslim was not viewed the way ISIS views Muslim today. I think that problem is ever present in, in, in any religion in the world. And in, in Buddhist case, this was carefully cultivated. But here I ought to bring in something special about Buddhism, which really has an influence in my judgment in thinking about the strategy. Buddhism has been famously more inclined to literacy than any other religion in the world. And in fact, there have been high, higher rates of literacy, even today Burma has a higher rate of literacy, miserable as it is than, the, than India has. Because there have been a tradition of reading, the difference is that you have to read the scriptures yourself. And that was a big thing, that one of the same. And you, if, you, if you look at the country around, you find that in uh, Burma, Thailand, and even Sri Lanka, having a higher level of literacy, historically. And that's still true. What it really means is that the ability to change the picture, and you have to not only make the world population understand what's going on, but over, above all, make the Burmese population understand. I think there is an enormous opportunity of education as opposed to miseducation, which is what we have seen. So I think one of the things that we have to bear in mind when we think about this strategy of how to change it, first of all, to insist that the government stopped the vilification and the and the and the, we a, a uh, an invention of a history that it didn't exist. Uh, stop the propaganda. Stop describing things which are utterly untrue. But also, you need to make a very big difference in terms of the understanding of the Burmese population as to what the Rohingya situation really is. You can't change it otherwise. Let me take a particularly. Um, uh, specific case here, and I'm speaking on the basis of a, my reading of newspapers and, and, and incidental intelligence that floats around the world. Take the case of Aung San Suu Kyi, great leader, had support from everywhere, could defeat the military government any time, even today. I think it's possible that it's possible that Aung San Suu Kyi originally underestimated the problem of the Rohingya. As a result, there was not enough bargaining made with the, with the government when there are various things bargaining to say that that is not going to happen. But given that, where does she stand now? If she were to recognize that Rohingya was being badly treated, and if she makes a statement on that, I think she loses the opportunity of winning an election today in Burma, given the way exciting excitement had been generated against the Rohingyas through systematic propaganda. So in order to win the battle, I think the support of the people is absolutely essential, who has been fed on lies. And this is not unknown. This is exactly what happened in, uh, in, in, in Italy, in, 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 in Germany, in a big way, and, uh, and people often uh, would, not, um, would, not, um, would not actually uh, recognize how the picture was changing, how people's perception was becoming different. That's how they went, Jews and Gypsies were separated out. The idea when Jews were among the, uh, I think, no country, in, in East Europe, probably, Jews felt as safe as they felt in Germany, because they're so much a part of the upper classes. Uh, and the fact is that, that that story could still be changed. 
chained by systematic lying and propaganda. And ultimately, you know, the genocide that happened and the, and the, and the Holocaust, it involved not only an evil government doing very nasty things, it involved the evil government first changing the character of the people. So that, so that you did not have the, the, uh, the perception. Now, they were successful in a way that... I think that is what, where we're going to stop. Uh, he made his point.